Hello all, Eric Rivenus from the Most Notorious Podcast here. So in a shameless one-time effort to promote my new podcast, I decided this week to do a crossover episode with the new show. This is part one of the 1909 murder of Louis Arbogast, and it's also a story of his wife and five daughters who bonded together to protect each other from prosecution. It's a fascinating story that I hope you enjoy. Once you're done, head on over for part two at Minnesota's Most Notorious, where blood runs cold. And if you're thinking to yourself, dang it, Eric, I want an interview this week, no worries. I've included an interview there, too. It's about Marjorie Congdon and the Glen Sheen murders, quite possibly the most infamous criminal and string of alleged murders in Minnesota history. It's it's a real soap opera. So again, check out my new interview this week on Minnesota's Most Notorious, Where Blood Runs Cold. And then back to our regular programming next week with a brand new interview here at Most Notorious. Cheers. It was a 16-year-old newsboy named Isidore Abrahamson who heard the terrified screams first as he walked by the Arbogast House at 286 West 7th Street in St. Paul in the early morning hours of May 13, 1909. They were standing outside on the step, two sisters in nightgowns, Ida and Minnie, both highly distraught and overcome with emotion. Ida cried, My poor papa! Won't someone please help my poor papa? While Minnie stood by, shrieking at the top of her lungs. The boy ran up the steps and into the hallway where the other Arbogast sisters, Louise and Flora, stood, weeping and wailing in grief. But Abrahamson didn't stop to console them. He flew up the staircase, rushing past Mrs. Arbogast coming down. When he got to the second floor, he followed the smell of gasoline fumes and smoke to the Arbogast parents' bedroom. There he found 51-year-old Louis Arbogast, patriarch of the family, lying on his bed and on fire. And the boy grabbed a sheet on the floor and started smothering the flames. He was soon joined by another young man named Henry Spangenberg, the fiancé of the eldest daughter Louise. Together they extinguished the fire. Both would later remember, from the corners of their eyes, a woman standing in the doorway, watching their efforts, although they were both too busy to pay close attention to her identity. Once the bed fire had been dealt with, Abrahamson then ran down the back stairs, where he found a burning roll of fabric and feathers, blazing so hot that the woodwork on the wall had caught fire. The newsboy managed to toss the bundle out the back door and then focused on putting out the fire that now threatened the house. In the meantime, firefighters had arrived and headed to the second floor. There they found the body of Louis Arbogast in a horrific state. He laid crosswise on the bed, naked. Feathers from the pillows were clotted with blood and scattered across his face. But if that wasn't disturbing enough, the back of his skull had been battered in hard enough that there was blood splatter on the walls. Blood soaked the sheet underneath him. Louis Arbogast was gasping for air, still alive, just barely. But he wouldn't be for much longer. This is Minnesota's Most Notorious, where blood runs cold, and this is the case of the Silent Sisters in a Sinister Secret. A secret that would pit the remaining members of the family against the St. Paul Police Department and the county attorney's office, in a series of twists and turns that would leave heads spinning across the city. A city that hoped for, no, demanded justice for the murdered man. But would there be justice for Louis Arbogast in the end? And what had been the motive, to even begin with, for murdering the man in charge of this allegedly idyllic family, a respected member of the community, a man with an irreproachable reputation, This is the mystery we will attempt to solve on this episode of Where Blood Runs Cold.
By all period measurements, Louis Arbogast had been a successful man. His prosperous butcher shop sat at one of St. Paul's Seven Corners on West 7th Street. In his house, a less-than-modest two-story beauty, surrounded by a short iron fence, was only a five-minute walk away. He was a plump, dark-haired, and mustached German immigrant who had taken good business sense and skills with a butcher's knife and created a comfortable, stable life for he, his wife Mina, and their five daughters. His worth at the time was rumored to be $200,000, a small fortune in 1909. Four of the five daughters lived at the family home. Flora, nicknamed Babe, was 16. Minnie was 18. Ida was 22. And the eldest, the beautiful Louise, 23. The fifth daughter, 19-year-old Emma, lived with her husband, Lawrence Ulmer, on South Exchange Street, only a block away. It seemed on the surface the perfect family. The daughters were all vivacious, carried full social calendars, and appeared independent and confident. So when the neighborhood was awakened by the piercing screams of the frightened sisters at a few minutes past 4 a.m., it would be impossible to predict at that moment to what lengths the women of the Arbogast family would ultimately go to keep their collective secret intact. Louis Arbogast, tenuously clinging to life, was loaded into a police ambulance as the frenzied sisters gathered on the front lawn and died on the way to St. Luke's Hospital. His wife Mina, assumably in bed with her husband during the attack, had suffered burns as well and was taken to City Hospital for examination. As for the police, they soon converged on the house, looking for evidence. Once detectives entered the home, they found Louise on her hands and knees at the door of her parents' room, sobbing. Detectives Daly and Sweeney followed blood drops from the bed, down two flights of stairs, and into the cellar. After a search, they found an axe, freshly stained with blood that spattered up the handle several inches. It had been poorly hidden under some clothing. They wrapped it loosely in newspaper and had it carefully carried out of the house. Upstairs, in the Arbogast bedroom, an empty two-gallon gasoline can with a strong smell was found near the burned bed. And there had been no attempt, or more likely no time, to return it to its usual place in the cellar after it had been used, assumably, to douse Mr. Arbogast. Parts of the sheets were still soaked with the liquid. The question of whether someone might have snuck in and committed the murder was put to rest for the police after examining the house and the surrounding area. Firemen later told them that they had been greeted by a watchdog when they had first arrived, a dog they later learned had prowled the fenced-in yard all night. A streetcar watchman, whose duties included monitoring the tracks for obstructions on that part of West 7th Street, including the tracks directly in front of the Arbogast house, had seen no one in the area and he'd started his shift at midnight and worked up until the chaos broke. Police also learned from the women themselves that the windows and doors of the house were locked shut through the night, with the exception of an open window in the Arbogast parents' bedroom, secured with a locked screen, and a cellar window covered with an untouched cobweb. On the surface, one would think that seasoned police detectives might have easily coerced a solid confession from any one of these scared young women that very morning. But the Arbogast family was no ordinary one, as the city of St. Paul would soon discover over the next few weeks, to their shock and sordid delight. Yes, the sisters and their mother had offered initial statements to the police in the hours after the crime, but they were full of emotion and contradiction. Two stories in particular confused the detectives. Lewis's wife, Mina, burned and hysterical, according to papers. Claimed she'd been in the bathroom, directly across from the bedroom, during the time that her husband had been attacked with the axe and then set on fire. When she heard the blood-curdling scream of her daughter Ida coming from her room, she rushed in and tried to pull her hefty husband off of the blazing bed. This is how she'd received her burns, she said. It was curious, however, to police that she was dressed in a fresh, clean nightgown unmarred by a rescue attempt. 
More suspicions were aroused when officers went into the bathroom and found a blood-stained woman's nightgown and other bloody undergarments in the bathtub. Someone had hastily tried to clean them. Youngest daughter Ida's story seemed far more believable. She'd been disturbed from her slumber in the bedroom she shared with her sister Louise by her mother's screams, she told the police, and rushed into her parents' room where she saw the bed on fire and her father's head bashed in. Her mother was lying next to him, her back facing his body. Ida ran to her mother's side, took her by the arms, and dragged her from the bed. Then she said the rest of her sisters awoke and ran down the stairs in a frenzy to get help. Beyond their confusion over the contradicting stories, detectives were especially off-put by the actions of daughter Louise. After the fire engines had left, one of the managers from the Arbogast butcher shop came up to the house. He'd grown concerned when his boss hadn't shown up to work on time and was met by Louise at the door. Papa is dead, she had told him. The gas just fell down on him and burned him. When he went inside, Mrs. Arbogast gave him a similar story. The gas fell down and burned him, and I am also burned. Louis Arbogast, by the way, had already been whisked away to the hospital at this point, but the family had not yet been notified of his death. Given no more information by the women, the butcher shop manager assumed his boss had committed suicide by gas and dashed off to find the family's doctor. When he returned unsuccessful, he was told a brand new story by Louise. Papa has a hole in his head. They say Papa shot himself, but I know he didn't. Papa wouldn't do such a thing. When I just screamed out, she continued, I came downstairs, and when I came back again, I saw the man who did it. He was standing pressed up against the wall on the stairs. He was just about your height with tousled hair and had a cap on, and his eyes looked straight at me, and I flew upstairs, and when I looked around again, he was gone. That's the man who did it. The detectives checked for a gas leak and found none. Local reporters, descending on the house later that day, were met with locked doors and silence. When a photographer tried taking a picture of the watchdog in the backyard, it was summoned by one of the girls back inside. More witnesses observed the family's stable boy shredding the murder mattress into pieces behind the house. When the boy was questioned by reporters, a voice from the house demanded that he stay quiet. No explanation was ever given by police as to why they didn't collect the mattress as evidence. Police cleared two of the suspects that day, the significant others of Louise and Emma, Henry Spangenberg and Lawrence Almer. Lawrence and Emma had been asleep in their own home when the murder happened, and Spangenberg had arrived at the Arbogast house after the commotion started. Both denied knowing anything about what had happened and refused to speculate on motive. Emma obviously had an alibi, too. She was the only one of the daughters who hadn't been locked up in the house, but of course remained mum when questioned by police. It was as if a giant wall of silence had sprung up around the entire family and their staff. Louis's brother, Henry Arbogast, visited the house later that day and was interviewed by a reporter. He had little to add, but what he did add was slightly ominous. I speak only to my brother. As I go to work, I pass in front of his shop and wave my hand at him. I never come here. I do not care to say what the trouble was. I must not say anything. You see, the house is locked. The murder could not have been committed by anyone on the outside. But about the murder, I cannot say anything. Rumors began circulating that all had not been well within the Arbogast home and there were deep and unsettling secrets that might have led to jealousy or revenge as a motive for his death. The motive, of course, was of the utmost importance for the police, but they were able to rule out robbery immediately. The father's gold watch and over $50 in cash was left on the bureau in his bedroom, and when police arrived, it was still there. John O'Connor, St. Paul's most famous police chief, who ruled the city's police force with an iron Irish fist, 
was keen to take charge of the investigation. It is more like the work of an insane person than anything else, he remarked, as he directed department efforts in the case. An initial theory was that it had been an attempted double murder, as Mrs. Arbogast also laid in the bed as it burned. But that was sensibly set aside, as there had been no attempt to bludgeon her with an axe, like her husband. The coroners who examined Arbogast's skull guessed that the person who had wielded the axe was probably not very strong. The axe handle, they thought, had rolled in the person's hand as it was swung, as the blow had glanced off of the right side of his head. While the skull still had been crushed, and with enough force to splatter blood on nearby wallpaper, a stronger person would have shattered the entire side of his head beyond recognition with a powerful, well-aimed slice of the blade. Instead, their conclusion was that the butt had basically bounced heavily off of Arbogast's head. It was after the axe blow, police believe, that the bed was then saturated with gasoline and set on fire. And there was no question either that the murder was a deliberate one and not a crime of instant rage or passion. The axe was normally kept in the shed behind the house and the gasoline can again in the cellar. Someone would have had to have taken the time to carry them to the bedroom, the gasoline can up two flights of stairs, and the axe one flight, and then the axe taken down to the basement and concealed. On May 15th, two days after the murder, Chief O'Connor told reporters that he knew who had killed Louis Arbogast. Much of his confidence stemmed from the continued questioning by police of two of their primary suspects, Mrs. Mina Arbogast and eldest daughter Louise. Mina Arbogast, checked into City Hospital to treat her injuries, was being closely guarded and interrogated by detectives. As for Louise... After the murder, she'd grown more and more upset and excited as the day had worn on, and checked herself into St. Luke's Hospital for a rest cure. Newspapers, curious as to what was causing what they called her nervous breakdown, began to delve into her background with glee. She had been known in the past, they wrote, to visit fortune tellers regularly and spend large amounts of money to help them make life decisions for her. One paper suggested she suffered from a number of nervous ailments, including deep melancholia and suicidal feelings, and had searched the country over the past few years for a cure. Another newspaper reported she'd spent Christmas of 1908 recuperating from one of her bouts in a sanatorium. Three months later, two doctors had informed her father, Lewis, that unless she was committed once more, there was a good chance she would kill herself or a family member. An alienist named Dr. Arthur Sweeney, who had examined her at St. Luke's two months earlier, told the papers that she had been hopelessly insane, and at the time of her release, she hadn't been cured. Things didn't help matters for her when Arbogast family physician, Dr. Bell Walrath, who in an era before doctor-patient privilege, willingly shared to newspapers her assessment of her longtime patient. There is no doubt whatever of Louise's mental condition, she said. She was a victim of advanced melancholia with a strong suicidal tendency and always with the homicidal possibility. As a rule, melancholia tends to suicide, but there are cases, and this was one of them, in which the homicidal tendency is strongly developed. Reporters were so desperate for scoops that they cornered an intern at St. Luke's Hospital, whose opinion they deemed important enough to print. The intern concluded that Louis Arbogast had effectively committed suicide through his decision to let her back in the house in her unstable mental state. Meanwhile, Mina Arbogast still in the hospital and under police restraint, was supposedly trying to stay quiet during her interrogations in a desperate attempt to shield Louise. But she was under severe mental duress herself, and during the questioning she let slip out some damning information about her daughter. 
Louise had just come back from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, four days prior to the murder, she'd said, where she'd been sent to get some rest. Once back in the home, Louise had paced up and down the hallways, moaning and wailing and muttering ghastly and unearthly things. Mrs. Arbogast also admitted that Louise had become violent, at one point striking her with her fist, and then with a hammer in her back. The hammer situation escalated to a struggle between the two, with the mother having to tussle with her daughter until she gave up her weapon. Less than two minutes later, Louise had regained her composure and was weeping in her mother's arms. Mrs. Arbogast also explained that the fortune tellers her daughter had frequented had poisoned Louise's head with dark thoughts of blood and mayhem, including a warning to her that a murder would soon shatter her life, the murder of someone very close to her. Newspapers began recalling past female killers and debating whether a woman might hang for murder in St. Paul. There had been a Minnesota precedent. Almost 50 years earlier, a woman named Ann Bolansky had lived with her husband, Stanislaus Bolansky, in an area not far from what is now the Ham's Brewery on St. Paul's east side. She'd poisoned her husband with arsenic, and after almost getting away with her crime, suspicion was aroused when she began having intimate relations with a man she'd told everyone was her nephew. In addition, a witness came forward, a friend of Anne's, who'd remembered her buying powdered arsenic not long before. Her husband's body was soon exhumed, and once the contents of his stomach were examined and evidence of arsenic was found, she was put on trial, found guilty, and sentenced to hang, publicly. The funeral for Louis Arbogast was held at Christ Church on Sunday, May 16th, under Masonic direction. And Louise, with two nurses as escorts, was allowed to leave the hospital and attend with the rest of her sisters, who had all been confined to their West 7th house since the murder. Hundreds of curiosity seekers gathered outside their home, watching the sisters like celebrities as they stepped into carriages and followed the procession to the church. One reporter, eager to find anything that might point to Louise's guilt, noted that she'd refused to look at the body of her father as he lay in his casket. So Louise, with her nervous ailments and strange history of behavior, was the natural prime suspect in this gruesome affair. And on May 17th, less than a week after her father was smashed with an axe and burned in his bed, his widowed wife would offer a brand new story to detectives that would confirm what they'd believed all along. Chief O'Connor explained how his detectives, Sweeney and Daly, had managed to withdraw a confession. They'd simply worn Mrs. Arbogast down to the point that she'd finally given in and told them that her daughter Louise was guilty. When pressed, she confessed to what happened that early morning of May 13, 1909. At 4.20 a.m., she explained, she'd come out of the bathroom and discovered Louise, wild-eyed, staring at her father as he lay in the flaming bed. The bloody axe lay at Louise's feet. Mrs. Arbogast then screamed, rushed into the room, and tried to put out the fire with her bare hands. Ida and Minnie ran in behind her, panicked and dashed down the stairs to yell for help. Minutes later, both mother and daughters began to dispose of evidence as best they could, instinctively understanding that their priority now was to protect Louise and each other. Along with the Ramsey County attorney, Richard O'Brien, the detectives took Louise from her hospital to her mother's hospital in hopes that a physical meeting between them would elicit some kind of emotional confrontation. So when Louise sat by her mother's bed with the police as witnesses and listened to her mother tell the story in front of her, she denied everything she heard. Mrs. Arbogast, frustrated, burst out, Louise, it is either you or me. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. You were outside father's door when I came from the bathroom. You must tell the truth. You must tell the truth. 
When Louise didn't respond, her mother began to shout. You say you didn't do it, but I know you did. Again, Louise denied knowing anything about the murder and stared straight ahead, quiet. And the silence continued for what seemed like forever. Until the tension was finally broken, when they both, almost together, began to sob uncontrollably. Louise knelt down at her mother's bedside, and they wept in each other's arms. On the next episode, which concludes the story of The Silent Sisters and a Sinister Secret, we learn both the final fate of Louise Arbogast and what was really going on behind the locked doors of the Arbogast house, including dark and disturbing rumors that could well have served as a motive for someone else in the house besides Louise to bludgeon and set fire to the patriarch of the Arbogast family. Thank you so much for listening to this very first episode of Minnesota's Most Notorious, Where Blood Runs Cold. I envision this podcast ultimately as a place for all things true crime in Minnesota. Most of the episodes will be narrations like this, but I also expect to occasionally fall back on my regular Most Notorious format and interview authors who are experts on local murders and mayhem in our fair state. I also plan on throwing in a biography every once in a while of a person who played an important role in some historical misdeed. I also encourage you to find us on Facebook, where I will post photos, diagrams, and illustrations of the various cases covered here. And if you want the deep cuts and be a real accessory to the crime, become a patron at patreon.com slash mostnotorious. Again, thank you for joining me at Where Blood Runs Cold. Stay tuned for more terrible tales of true crime in Minnesota soon.